Hello and welcome to St. Bridget Catholic Church. I am Deacon Leo Gehafer, and we are delighted that you have joined us for our Good Friday Reflections. Jesus spoke only seven times from the cross before he died. So let us begin our reflections on those seven last words of Christ. Sacred scripture tells us when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him and the criminals there, one on his right, the other on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They divided his garments by casting lots. The people stood by and watched. The rulers Meanwhile, sneered at him and said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the chosen one, the Messiah of God. Even the soldiers jeered at him. As they approached to offer him wine, they called out, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Above him, there was an inscription that read, This is the King of the Jews. Our first word, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. To say that there was real confusion about who Jesus was and what he came to do would be somewhat the understatement, as witnessed by the comments of the rulers and the soldiers in this scripture passage from Luke's Gospel. It was in this eternally important moment of God's plan for our redemption, as Jesus, while in agony, nailed to the cross, lifted high for all to see, offers his first word as he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Throughout his lifetime, Jesus spoke many words as he taught, fed, healed, encouraged, admonished, blessed, and loved his people. Every word was purposeful and perfect. So why wouldn't Jesus, at his hour of death, in the midst of such anger, hatred, and confusion, clearly articulate in his first word who he is, the Son of God, as he calls out to his Father. And what he came to do, reconcile humanity to God through the forgiveness of sins, as he says, forgive them, while acknowledging how it is even possible that we should deserve such merciful consideration, as he says, they know not what they do. Through his passion and crucifixion, Jesus witnesses to us the very reason why the Word became incarnate, had to suffer, die, and rise from the dead in obedience to the will of the Father, accomplishing the eternal plan for our redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Yes, God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, and Jesus, with his dying breath, pleads with the Father on our behalf to forgive our sins, for we do not know what we are doing. Is it really possible that we are so ignorant that we really do not know what we are doing? It is interesting to note that even 2,000 years later, with the advantage of acquired knowledge, experience, understanding, and wisdom, our broken humanity remains the same. Oftentimes we too may be inclined to do just like those who nailed Jesus to the cross, to choose to turn away from God and to sin, thinking all the while that we truly know 
what we are doing. Unfortunately, in our ignorance and in our brokenness, we cannot truly comprehend the devastating evil of sin. For if we could, we would never choose it. Conversely, if we could ever comprehend God's eternal and unconditional love and mercy poured out through Christ on the cross, we would always choose it. St. Paul acknowledges this reality as he tells us, God proves his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, we all have sinned and are in need of forgiveness. In 1 John we read, if we say we are without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. However, if we acknowledge our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. Consequently, by our ignorance and through our sins, we do in a certain way become accomplices to our Lord's passion. So let us bring our ignorance and our sinfulness to the cross of Christ, understanding that with humble and contrite hearts, we can be forgiven. On this Good Friday, we look upon the cross at Christ crucified. And as we do so, our hearts are broken by the horrific reality of our sin. And yet in the same moment, the very same moment, our hearts are overwhelmed by the depth of God's love and mercy. How do we witness the reality of this love and mercy that has been so graciously and eternally extended to us? Well, I believe that just as we can love one another because we have first been loved by God, likewise, we can forgive one another because we have first been forgiven by God. We simply become conduits of God's love and mercy. We know this as each time we pray the Our Father, we recite the words of our Lord and Savior as we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Our prayer is to become not only beneficiaries, but extenders of God's love and mercy as well. Are there people in our lives whom need us to offer forgiveness? If so, let us be quick to extend forgiveness and recall the first word of our Lord from the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, in our ignorance, we turn away from you and sin. Forgive us for the many sins and help us to be ignorant of the things of this world that lead us away from you. And yet, be truly wise in the eternal reality of your love, mercy, and forgiveness. Amen. Jesus, in thy dying words, even while thy life blood flows, asking pardon for thy faults, hear us, holy Jesus. Oh,
The second word, today you will be with me in paradise. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place which is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. One of the criminals railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Remember me, when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Both Luke and Matthew describe that there were two men who were crucified alongside Jesus. Luke refers to them as criminals, Matthew as robbers. These two men heard the soldiers and the rulers mocking Jesus. One criminal joined them in mocking Jesus, but the other, the one we know as the good thief, rebuked the first. This repentant criminal then turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Here were these two criminals, these thieves. Both knew the crime that Jesus was alleged to have committed. They saw the sign above his head that read, the King of the Jews. Both had heard Jesus ask the Father to forgive those who were putting him to death. One joined with those who mocked Jesus, the other defended him. One was arrogant in his disdain for Jesus, the other was humble in his presence. One lacked remorse for the crimes he had committed, the other acknowledged his guilt, accepted his punishment, but asked Jesus for mercy. Please join with me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. If we look closely at our own lives, I suspect that most of us can see some of both thieves in our lives. At various times, we may have disowned or denied the Lord. We may have taken the Lord's name in vain. We may have been arrogant in dismissing God from our lives. We may have lacked remorse for the things we have done, the sins we have committed. But at other times, we have accepted God in our lives. We have defended God from the taunts of others. We have been humbled by our own sinfulness. We have acknowledged our guilt, accepted our punishment, and asked God for mercy. Each one of us, myself included, is a sinner. God wants us to be sorry for our sins. In fact, that sorrow for our sins is a condition of God's mercy. As St. Augustine wrote, God created us without us, but he did not will to save us without us. God did not need anything from us to create us, but he needs something from us to forgive us. 
we must take the first step. To receive God's mercy, we must admit our faults, we must confess our sins. In admitting our faults, we must show true remorse for our sins, for having offended God. We must repent. We need to have genuine sorrow for our sins and a desire to turn away from our sinful inclinations. But we can't stop with repentance. True repentance has to lead to something else. It must lead to conversion to a radical moral and spiritual change in our lives, to a change of heart away from sin and toward God. Now, we all know that God is a merciful God. Jesus told us that the Father loves us so much that he would leave the 99 sheep to go after the missing one and bring that missing sheep back to the flock. He gave us the example of the Good Samaritan so that we might see what it means to be merciful. And he told us that the father rejoices when his prodigal children return to him and seek forgiveness. The good thief is a perfect perfect example for us as sinners. He showed us how to humbly acknowledge the presence of sin in our lives to repent of those sins, to accept penance for our sins, and to humbly ask God for forgiveness, for mercy. And the good thief taught us something more. Like the good thief, each of us will face an end to our lives. But we know that there is something waiting for us after our death. If we have faith, believe in God, acknowledge our sins, repent and seek to convert our lives. Jesus told us, those who believe in me, even if they die, will live. And he told us that in the Father's house, there are many dwelling places waiting for us and that he has gone there to prepare a place for us. When the good thief asked for mercy, Jesus gave him so much more. Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. This promise far exceeded what the good thief reasonably could have expected. Recall that his request had been that Jesus remember him when he came into his kingdom. Jesus responded to the good thief that he would be with Jesus in paradise. The same is true for us. God's mercy, God's promise of eternal life with him far exceeds anything to which we might be entitled or could reasonably expect. Now it's natural for us to wonder what paradise, what heaven will be like. We are impatient people. We want to find out now what heaven will be like. Well, the catechism tells us this. To live in heaven is to be with Christ, to be forever in his presence. When our time comes to leave this world, there is no other place that we should want to be than present in the presence of Almighty God for all eternity. So our job on this earth is clear. We need to acknowledge our sins, repent that we have offended God, convert our lives, and ask God for mercy. And just like the good thief, if we do all these things, Jesus will give us much more than we could ever imagine or deserve. Jesus will give us the gift of paradise, the gift of heaven, being in the presence of God for all eternity. And so we ask Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, pity
When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. The chapel of the Immaculate Conception at Mount St. Mary's University in Emmitsburg, Maryland, has a life-size statue of the crucifixion behind the altar. With Jesus on the cross, Mary, the women, and St. John standing around the foot of the cross, as well as Roman guards. It's a beautiful depiction of the crucifixion. Whenever I see this depiction of the crucifixion, or any depiction of the crucifixion, whether it's in a statue or a painting, or on film, it appears to be an image of sorrow, one of pain and suffering, both the physical suffering of Christ and the suffering of his mother and those whom he loved. I began my reflection with this image in mind. I had almost completed my reflection on these words of Christ, aware that Jesus' mother Mary the holy women and St. John the Evangelist had stayed with Jesus when all his other followers had abandoned him. My reflection was on the faith and love it took for Mary and the others to be with Jesus throughout his crucifixion. But as I read through it, I was nagged by the word faith. Mary's staying with Jesus was not out of faith. It was from a mother's deep love. All the women who stayed with Mary and with Jesus were driven by a love that was blind to any danger. They were driven by the love they had for Jesus. I realized that instead of faith and love, it should be just love. Love is stronger than faith. We talk of the holy martyrs dying for their faith, but they died for their love of Jesus. Yes, they had faith in abundance, but what moved them from fear to joy in the hour of their deaths was first their love for Jesus and then their faith in the promise of heaven. St. Paul tells us that faith, hope, and love remain but the greatest of these is love, that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. The women and St. John did not follow Jesus to his crucifixion because they had faith that they would not suffer arrest and meet the same fate as our Lord, they followed Jesus because they had a love that was stronger than their fear. Their love overcame their fear. It was out of love that he allowed himself to be arrested, tried, and crucified. When Joe Ferris was here for our Lenten mission, he pointed to the crucifix we have above the altar, and he said, this is the, per this is the picture of perfect love. And those words have really resonated with me. And on that hilltop, as Jesus was dying on the cross of our salvation, his perfect love continued. He was well aware of the love and sorrow that his mother, St. John, and the holy women were feeling. His love for them overcame his pain, overcame his suffering, and through the blood and sweat, he looked down at his mother and his heart was moved for love for her. And he said, woman, behold your son. 
Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. His thoughts and prayers were always for others. He never stopped loving even those who had treated him so cruelly. We may find it difficult, even impossible, to have the love that Christ had in accepting his suffering and death, in giving up his life for all of us. But we can follow the example of Mary, the women, and St. John in loving Christ so thoroughly that we put our fears aside and we follow Jesus where he will lead us. Pray with faith to love as much as Mary and the disciples whom he loved. Pray with faith for the love to walk past the Roman guards, past those who jeer at us, past our fears, and to remove from our lives the things that hold us back from following Christ wherever he may lead us. Jesus loving to the end Have whose heart thy sorrows rend And thy dearest soon unfriend Hear us, O Now from the sixth hour, there was a darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Why did Jesus cry out to his father, Why have you forsaken me? Jesus was in a state of agony. He knew he was near death, he had been mocked by the crowd and the soldiers even as he hung on the cross, and some in the crowd were even curious to see if Elijah would come to save him, and as usual, they got it wrong. Some believed that he had given up. Some believed that the death was too gruesome even for him and that he felt betrayed. After all, it seems that everyone around him had left him. What could he say? I quit? Jesus never wasted words, even at the moment of his death. He expressed who he was and how he felt by the words he chose, even just before his death. And these words were not just for him and by him, but for all of us as well. 
It is well known that the words he chose were the beginning of Psalm 22. Every Jew at the crucifixion would have known their origin and meaning. Psalm 22 was a lament believed to have been composed by David in reaction to his suffering and sense of abandonment. It was David's prayer. But Psalm 22 is also one of the most prophetic poems to foretell the circumstances and meaning of Jesus' death. And Jesus expressed his anguish and in the process taught us even at this point. Rather than just only talking about the psalm, let us take a few minutes to pray it directly. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and no man, scorned by men and despised by people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me and wag their heads. He committed his cause to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You kept me safe upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a raving and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. Yes, dogs are around about me. A company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothes they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, are not far off. O oh, my help, hasten to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion, my afflicted soul from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you sons of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you sons of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the afflictions of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from them, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will, I will pay before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Yes, to him shall all the proud of the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and he who cannot keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. Men shall tell of the Lord to the coming generation and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, that he has wrought it. We can notice that after each strophe of the lament and anguish, there is an acknowledgement of God's graciousness and saving power. Historically, for all the Jews, God always came through with forgiveness and restitution. The psalm also portends 
the deliverance to a people yet unborn. He has wrought it. That is us and all before us and after us. Jesus, as a man, knew this psalm. And even though he might have had the genuine emotion of being abandoned, he trusted in his Father's graciousness and saving goodness. How often have circumstances turned against us in life? How often might we have felt abandoned by everyone, including Almighty God? The psalm teaches us to have faith and trust in God's plan for us, even though we might not know how he will fulfill it or when. Jesus's anguish and pain were real. His not knowing how his father's plan would be fulfilled was probably a great part of his anguish. But, 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 he never gave up trust. We have been given an account of Jesus's agony on the cross. We have been given an account of Jesus's life and teaching. We have also been given Psalm 22 to help us through the tough times. Contemplate the passion of Jesus. Contemplate on Psalm 22 and celebrate Easter as never before. It is a final proof of Jesus' saving gift to us. Amen. Jesus bound in fears on The fifth last word, I thirst. After this, aware that everything was now finished in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. After being crucified and left to die upon the cross, how difficult must it have been to speak at all? Jesus has to push himself up by his feet, which now have a spike in them, just to get some air in order to say, I thirst. Jesus hasn't had anything to eat or drink since the Last Supper, and until this point, we don't hear Jesus make any requests for anything that might buy, provide comfort to his human body. I thirst seems out of character for Jesus to begin thinking about himself. In the last words of Christ, words one through four, we hear Jesus speaking about others or to his father. But now in this fifth last word, it is the first time we hear Jesus speak about what seems to be himself. I thirst. 
When we hear Jesus use I statements, they're usually used to teach us about our faith or about salvation. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine, you are the branches. When Jesus says, I thirst, he is speaking about a very personal need. With only a few breaths left, these two words must be very important. Given Jesus' deliberate nature and the high personal price Jesus paid just to say them to us as he is about to die. On the surface, it might sound like Jesus is speaking about himself. But what was Jesus really thirsting for? Is he thirsting for us? Could it be that when Jesus says, I thirst, he's thirsting for our faith? In the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4, which we may have heard just a few weeks ago, the topic is thirst. Jesus asks for a drink, but he's really thirsty for the woman's faith. And after some brief dialogue, Jesus tells the woman that he can provide living water. Jesus tells her that whoever drinks of the earthly water in the well will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I shall give will never thirst. The water I shall give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. But the woman misses the point and stays on the bodily need for water. Sir, give me this water so I may not be thirsty or have to keep coming here to this well to draw water. But then they engage in a deeper discussion on faith. Thirst is used to start the dialogue. What dialogue is Jesus trying to start with you? In Psalm 42, we hear, like a deer that yearns for running streams, so my soul is thirsting for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for God, the God of my life, When can I enter and see the face of God? My soul is thirsting. This goes way beyond the need of our mortal bodies to what really matters, care for our soul, a deep thirst. We aren't just to accept the gift of Jesus dying for our sins in a passive state. We must be prepared to follow his model. We too, must selflessly die for others, to put the needs of others ahead of our own, to die to self. The more we deny self, the more we say yes to Jesus, and the more we say yes to Jesus, the more we deny self. When Jesus says, I thirst, how are we to respond to this thirst? What should we give him? Do we give Jesus everything? all of our joys, all of our love, all our burdens, all our sins, all our worries, our fears, anxieties, our whole heart. What am I to give Jesus to satisfy this thirst? In meditating on the phrase, I thirst, we might hear Jesus call our name, Bill, I thirst, or Sarah, I thirst. Hear Jesus call your name. What is Jesus asking you to do for him today? Listen as Jesus starts the dialogue. Jesus is in love with you at this very moment, and he brings forgiveness and mercy and love to each of us. But sometimes we may not feel worthy or feel ready. But if we can accept that Jesus loves us exactly as we are today at this moment and not the way we think we should be, then we can begin to experience how he thirsts for us. As Jesus gave his life away for us, we grow by giving our lives away for others. Every time we take care of our fellow brothers and sisters by visiting with them or having a meal with them, or helping those who are sick or homebound 
or in prison or in, have a need of any kind, when we do this, we show others how much Jesus loves them and doing our part to ensure his thirst for all of humanity can be shared. Dear Jesus, I thank you for all of the suffering you endured on that cross. Besides extraordinary physical and psychological pain, you also experienced extreme thirst, thirst that cannot be quenched by any material substance. It is beyond humbling to think that while you were dying on that cross, you were thirsty for me. It's hard to comprehend that when I consider my sinful self. I know that sin leads to death, but I realize that by your dying and rising, you destroyed my death. Yes, Lord, I too am thirsty. I drink lots of water every day, but the thirst doesn't go away. I have a higher level thirst that can't be satisfied by water. It can only be quenched by you. I am thirsty for the Holy Spirit to fill my soul. I am thirsty for you, Lord. Amen. Jesus, in thy thirst and pain, while thy wounds thy life blood drain, thirsting more our love to gain, hear us, Holy Jesus. Thirst for us in mercy still, on thy holy work fulfill. Satisfy thy loving will, hear us, Holy Jesus. May we thirst thy love to know, need us in our sin and woe. The sixth word, it is finished. We hear these words from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 30. Here's what it says. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, it is finished. After 33 years on this earth, his human life is nearing completion. Is that what Jesus meant when he said, it is finished? Did he mean that his earthly life is now ending as he hung upon the cross in excruciating pain, suffering, coming to the end of something? It might be that he meant that his life was coming to an end, but that's not the complete answer to the statement. From the moment that the angel Gabriel came to Mary at the Annunciation, his father had set in place his plan for the salvation of the world. Hear these words that we're so familiar with from the Gospel of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. Jesus was sent by his father into the world to save us from ourselves. 
Hear me again. Jesus was sent into the world by his Father to save us from ourselves. And only Jesus could restore the world and all of its inhabitants to the original intention that his Father had, the Father's intention for Adam and Eve and for all who would follow after them. Only Jesus could conquer the evil one and destroy death forever. To many standing at the foot of the cross, I wonder what they were thinking. And I'm not speaking about Mary and John and Mary Magdalene. I'm thinking about the others as they stood there and watched Jesus exclaim and hear him say, it is finished. Some of them maybe thought that he had simply failed in his mission. Others may have thought that he was just saying that he was getting ready to die and that was all there was to it. But they had grand hopes for him, some of them. Hopes that he would be the real Messiah, hopes that he would rescue them from the Roman occupation. All of their hopes for many of them that had been aroused in his lifetime were now gone when he exclaimed, it is finished. Some of them may have even thought some kingdom this is or some God this is. This Jesus who for three years kept telling them that he was the son of God now hangs in front of them preparing to die and simply say, it is finished. And for some, maybe for them, they were having their last laugh at Jesus as he cried out the words, it is finished. So what did he really mean? What did Jesus really mean when he said that it was finished? I think what he truly meant and what he meant means is that he declared to the entire world that the redemption of the human race was complete. He reached out to his father and proudly exclaims, it is finished. Father, I made it. Father, thank you for giving me the courage to accomplish your will for me and for the entire human race. Jesus is not saying that his life is over. He's simply proclaiming that his purpose for coming into the world is now complete. Earlier in John's gospel, Pilate says to Jesus, then you are a king? And Jesus replies, for this I was born, and for this I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. And what is the truth that Jesus bears witness to? The truth is that God loves all of his children. God loves you and he loves me. The truth is that we are incapable of overcoming sin and paying the price of our own sins on our own. The truth is that only God can conquer the evil one and save us from the devil's many de deceptions and temptations. Saint Anselm of Canterbury once wrote, only two things can be done to remedy the wrong against God that we call sin. Sin must either be punished or satisfaction for the offense must be made. Through Jesus, satisfaction took the place of our punishment. Jesus took our part by taking our place. Think of that. Jesus took our part by taking our place. Our beginning is found in Jesus's sixth last word, it is finished. So what can we take away from this sixth last word? First, I think we can trust that Jesus has taken all of our sins upon his own shoulders. He bears their burdens for each of us. He has conquered Satan once and for all. Satan, who brought down Adam and Eve, can still deceive us, but Satan, no longer has any power over, over us. 
Because of his holy cross, Jesus has redeemed the world and it truly is finished. But Jesus' mission on earth, even though completed on the cross, still goes on. It is true that it is finished, and it is also true that Christ lives on in each one of us. But there is one more truth. Not everyone on this earth believes in Jesus. And even if they know about Jesus, many choose not to follow him. His saving grace from the cross lives in the hearts and soul of those men and women and children who believe in him and those who recognize him as their savior and in those who ask for his forgiveness. We cannot simply sit back and be content with the sacrifice that he made for each of us. In reality, it is not finished until every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Christ lives in us and we must be his light for all to see. And I'd like us to close this sixth word simply by praying the Our Father together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus was a ransom paid on thy Father's will obeyed by thy suffering perfect made hear us holy Jesus save us in our soul's distress be our help to cheer and bless while we grow in holiness hear us holy Jesus brighten all our heavenward way with an ever holier ray till we pass to perfect day hear us holy Jesus It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, because of an eclipse of the sun. Then the veil of the temple was torn down the middle. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. These are the last words from Christ before he dies. It is a direct reference to Psalm 31. Free me from the net they have set for me, for they are my refuge. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Psalm 31 is for when one is in deep distress in giving thanksgiving for escape. 
It is also a sign of complete trust. Christ knows the mission, a mission to reconcile man to God the Father. And to accomplish this, he is to sacrifice himself for our sins. He is human and divine, and at this moment, he is committing his whole self, the human and the divine, into God's hands. This commitment is the beginning of the end of his mission. For upon his death, he descends into hell to be raised in glory in three days. Christ, at the moment of his death, has taken on the sins of the world. He did this willingly, even with everything that he had gone through this past week. The triumphant entry into Jerusalem, the Last Supper, the agony in the garden, the betrayal for 30 pieces of silver by Judas, a friend, the denial by Peter, the man to whom Christ entrusted his church, the trial by the Sanhedrin and Pontius Pilate, the rejection by his people, living through the excruciating pain of the scourging and crucifixion. He willingly and acceptingly took on all this rejection and torture to reconcile us to the Father. At the moment of his last breath, he took on all our sins, but not just our sins. He took on the sins of all those who came before and all those who are to come. He knew this was his mission. He knew it so well that in the garden on the Mount of, Saint, Mount of Olives, he said, and I quote from Luke, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Still, not my will, but yours be done. And to strengthen him, an angel from heaven appeared to him. Knowing what was to come, Jesus was fully trusting in the Lord our God, and our Lord sent him an angel to strengthen him, an act that any father would do to help their child through a crisis. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Commend, it is defined as an action to present as suitable for acceptance. Christ, who has endured all pain and suffering, who has reconciled the world to God the Father. He is giving his spirit to the Father to be reunited with him. The love that Christ has for the Father and the desire to be reunited with his Father is wrapped up in this statement. It is a statement that is said aloud for all to hear, but it is not directed to us. It is directed to the Father. The moment Christ took his last breath, he trustingly gave his spirit to God, knowing that he will descend into hell and that the Father will raise him on the third day in glory. Many may see this as the end, but it is the beginning of our reconciliation to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus descends into hell with the sins of the world upon him. Three days later, he is raised in glory by the Father, whom Jesus loves and trusts, and is now reunited with him. Christ models what we are to do, to give our whole self to God, trusting that God will raise us to be with him for eternity. We are to live for God, to be one with him, what better model do we have than Christ in offering our lives on a daily basis, hoping and praying that we too can be worthy to commend our lives and spirit to God? Let us pray that we can emulate Christ, that he provides us with his angels to give us the strength to persevere in our love for our Father. We should trust the Father just as Christ trusted the Father to live our lives in him, 
giving our hearts and souls in love to the Father every day. Let us live each day believing in the Father and to be able to say, just as Christ said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Jesus, on the 